Well, I suppose, uh, Janvi, should should we start? Should I start? Yes, yes, definitely. Whenever you're ready. Well, yeah. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm really glad that you have come, and I'm thankful to Nili Mabhat, my good friend, for having invited me uh, to talk about regenerating the pre-Columbian Amazonian soil as an alternative to the materialist paradigm. So uh, let me start with the first slide. Uh, this is our very new, uh, we just finished it, auditorium uh, at Sachamama. Uh, Sachamama is a nonprofit center that has both a seat in the US and in Peru. And the names in both places is different, uh, slightly different. Um, you see the logo is a very long snake in the style of the pre-Columbian people of this region. Here I am in the upper Peruvian Amazon uh, on the northeastern foothills of the Andes, very hilly, very tropical, very beautiful. And this, th this is the style of the pre-Columbian uh, Chachapoyas culture, which existed here before the Spaniard uh, colonized. The snake is the spirit of the rainforest. And the name of this, of the rainforest is Sachamama, which means the spirit of the rainforest. So I will just show you a few, or just one or two slides of parts of our center. Uh, this is our ecological swimming pool uh, with a painting over here by a friend who lives here. Um, and uh, uh, the water is, is sanitized with hydrolyzed sea salt. So it's completely ecological. Uh, and here is the what we call chakra huerto chakra is the food garden and huerto chakra is a quichua word and huerto is a spanish word uh, the huerto is the garden around the house the chakra the food field is typically with the indigenous people and the, the small uh, farmers the small agriculturalists is in the forest because the, the method used for growing food is called slash and burn. You make a clearing in the rainforest and uh, you, you, you do not uproot the trees. You cut them at about waist high and you burn the branches. And this gives some nutrient to the Amazonian soil, which is very poor, in fact. Amazonian soil is very poor. So the fertility comes from the humus that falls from the trees. So we have just redone our Chakra Huerto with a stone uh, because our land is very steep. We are in the, in the foothills and we've just redone it with stone retaining walls. So I'm very proud of it. I think it looks beautiful. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. Now. I'm sorry to cut you, uh, but can you please full screen the PowerPoint presentation? It's minimized right now. It's minimized. Yeah. Can you see it now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Is it okay? Okay. Now this. You can also put it on slideshow, Frederick. Frederick, yeah, you, you put it, it on slideshow, then we can see the whole instead of the. Yeah, just put it on. Where is, where is that? Where do I find slides? At the top, at the top panel bar. Oh, at yes, the top, yes, yes, yes. yes, got it. Like play from current slide. Uh, and then, and then what? That's what I I clicked slideshow. Um, you can click on from beginning, and then. You well, you can go from current slide. Yeah. The second from the left, you can see it says from current slide. You click on that. Exactly. Ah, much better. <laughs> and to get to the next slide, how do I do that? You just click the arrow. Janvi? 
you to, it would take you to your name. The what? I can't hear you. Um, I can't hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. The, yes. the, the internet is not very strong here, but so sometimes your voice disappears. Um, so for the next slide, what do I why do I click? You can click the right arrow on your keyboard. Okay, right. Um, so to make this uh, Amazonian pre-Columbian soil, which uh, scholars call anthropogenic, I will explain later why I have rejected that term. But for now, I, I will say that uh, there are two methods. We have two methods. One is to uh, is the easy method, and this is the easy method. Uh, next, there we go. This is the easy method. What is this method? You see this dark, we have been accumulating uh, food scraps and the cuttings from the land. And uh, because of pandemic, we didn't do anything. So it generated a huge amount of compost, this deep dark earth here, which we have put on the, uh, on the Chakra Huerto. Uh, so that's a very easy method that anybody uh, with no resources, the smallest uh, agriculturist the, in the small native communities can do. Now, the next slide. Uh, this is called a pyrolysis oven. What is a pyrolysis oven? To make biochar, which is an, a new name given by specialists to, uh, to a charcoal made under high, uh, very high temperatures with no or very little oxygen. So what you see here is a, a cylindrical container of stainless steel with a, uh, a lid that closes it completely so that hardly no, ideally no air comes in. And you, you, you fill it with a biomass. The biomass we have chosen that works best for us, and that is free because I decided if, you know, small farmers are going to use it, it has to be free, is coconut husks, uh, emptied coconut husk. They work very well. So you build a fire under the, the cylinder, you make a fire with uh, branches that have fallen on the land. Our land is forested and, uh, and you burn it at high temperature. You feed this fire. And then what you have to do, you see uh, these tubes. These tubes go into the cylinder uh, and, and behind the cylinder, uh, the tube, there's a valve that opens and closes. And when the temperature is very high, after about an hour of burning, you open that valve and it sends the gases that emerge from the carbonizing of the biomass. They are very, uh, they're very, uh, how do you say, contaminating. They are called syn gases, S. Y and syn gases, and they are redirected under, you can't see it now, under the cylinder, the tube has holes. So the syn gases come out and burn. So you, you neutralize, you, 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 you destroy the syn gases, they don't go into the air. So you're not, you are not uh, damaging uh, the, the environment. So this kind of, uh, this um, oven was designed by the one I call my godson, who is my heir here and is now the, the president here in Peru. Uh, and it works very well. Uh, we've just redone it, so it looks new, and it is. <laughs> Here is a diagram. The great um, 
expert, scientific expert of this pre-Columbian Amazonian dark earth is at Cornell University in the soil department, the soil science department of Cornell University. Johannes Lehmann is his name. And uh, he worked in, in Brazil where they first archeologists discovered this soil. And they called it anthropogenic because it's full of broken ceramics. Now he has made this diagram and uh, in which it shows the pyrolysis, which is this oven uh, where you carbonize um, biomass at high temperature with little or no oxygen. And, uh, and the whole process, as he shows here, ends up withdrawing from the atmosphere 20% of carbon or other uh, greenhouse gases. So it's very powerful. And it's due to this biochar. 20% uh, is a huge amount. So in other words, if all agriculture was agriculture with this type of soil, we would not have a climate crisis. It would sequester the, because we don't emit 20% of uh, CO2 or other greenhouse gases. So it would be a very effective method. And so this has potentially a huge implication, this kind of making this kind of soil. But we are up against industrial agriculture and the fantastic financial power of the pesticides, fertilizers, seed industry. That's what we are up against. So it's very hard. But small farmers around the world are doing it. We went online about the oven, the pyrolysis oven, and people are devising backyard pyrolysis oven all over the world. Um, so we call uh, this earth, this dark earth is called, um, well, differently, it, it was first given a Portuguese name because the first archeology span that discovered it uh, happened in Brazil, Terra Preta do Indio, which means Black Earth of the Indians. Uh, we have rebaptized it in, in Quichua, uh, Yana Achpa, which means Black Earth. Um, and, uh, and instead of calling it an anthropogenic soil, we call it a cosmocentric soil, and it will become clearer later in my presentation what that means. Okay, next slide. Because this is a, a map of the Amazon basin. So Peru is on the, let's see if I can show you, I don't know if you can see. Peru is on the Western side around here. And we are somewhere around here, Lamas, on the foothills of the Andes. Uh, there are nine countries uh, bordering the Amazonian basin. The, the largest part of it is Brazil, but Peru, about 75% of Peru's land is Amazonian, Amazonian, both high and low. Uh, and the color is red, indicates ceremonial centers. The blue mounted rig, rig, vill, ring villages, white fortified settlements, yellow large platform mounds, and then other sites which are cities, especially along the rivers. So this, this is what archeology span in the Amazon basin has shown. The Amazon is not what I was taught in graduate school in anthropology, uh, you know, made up, um, uh, inhabited by small scale uh, communities practicing slash and burn. Totally wrong. It turns out the first civilizations in the Americas, in all of the Americas, began in the Amazon. You have cities, long cities, over 30 kilometers long with uh, ceremonial centers. 
and other other evidence of uh, high civilization. When the first Spaniard went down the Amazon uh, in 1541 and 42, the friar, who was the only literate one, uh, wrote down everything he saw and he described big cities and he described all of that. Uh, and they sent it to the King of Spain and it was declared to be a lie because the next Spaniards who went down a few months later found only forest and small, small groups. What happened is that uh, nine out of 10 people died. So uh, the forest took over and the civilizations collapsed. So this is uh, a slide uh, that shows one such uh, ceremonial center in the upper Amazon, in our region. It's kind of north of us here in Lamas, about six hours north of us in a, in a valley. Uh, and it just, just to give you a sense that uh, there was in this region, even in the foothills, not just the low Amazon uh, civilization. This is a slide of Monte Grande, that same site where uh, they excavated a, a burial and they found this skeleton and he is wearing its man. I believe he's wearing, I don't know if you can see it, a snail, these big snails, which we have plenty of around here, snail necklace. Why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this because I want you to see the next slide. This is a contemporary existing living uh, maestro, curandero, or shaman. He's a shaninka and he, I, I did ayahuasca with him once. He was working with the nearby center called Takiwasi here. And now he has his own center in Pucallpa. Uh, and he wears the same necklace of uh, snail necklaces that you find in this pre-Columbian uh, burial. So this is to illustrate the fact that there are things that have remained uh, alive with the indigenous inhabitants of this region. But at the same time, uh, the impact of the Spanish colonization is also huge. So you have a kind of a, a mixed, um, you know, a mixed, a mixed result between indigenous practices and Spanish practices. Now let me, I'm going to go very briefly a thumbnail background for understanding the impact of the Spanish colonizer in South America. The reason being that to understand local uh, reality, you have to understand where the um, so-called con conquistadores, the colonizer, what kind of culture did they come from? What was going on in Europe? Okay, I am going to focus on uh, the medieval and Renaissance worldview in Europe called anima mundi, the soul of the world. That, that is one representation here of anima mundi, which is striking. It's a, a naked woman with very long uh, hair surrounded by the cosmos. Um, the worldview of Anima Mundi saw the world as completely integrated with everything and every being in it connected to any other and any one in which, to any other and one in which the divide the, the divine pervaded everything. This is what is called a cosmocentric worldview. 
uh, it was the world view of the so-called witches and other peasant oral healers in Europe, as well as the literate occult philosophers. The church and also after 1521, one when the Protestant uh, variant of Christianity appeared, considered this worldview heretical. It's a worldview that's uh, in its essence, similar to, to Amazonian worldviews, in which the world is alive, is sacred, and everything is connected to everything. And humans are one earth being among many others. And the earth is female. Cosmos is female. This is Pope Innocent VIII uh, in 14, 1884. This Pope declared that certified witches were heretics that needed to be burned alive. And that's what happened. And here's a drawing uh, of burning witch. It took place approximately from the 15th century to the end of the 17th century in Western Europe. The number of women killed varies greatly according to different scholars, but some affirm it could be as high as 1 million women. Some men were also killed. This was going on in Spain at the time of the conquista in South America. And this is very important, and I will show you why it is important. Here is another drawing about they tortured witches with mechanical devices. He's turning a wheel and she's partially hung uh, to make them confess uh, about what? Confess about having consorted with the devil. That's what the inquisition, the inquisitors were looking for. This is a picture of Francis Bacon you know, as his dates. He's an early father of the new mechanistic worldview. He transformed the earth from a nurturer, nurturing mother and womb of life into a source of secrets to be extracted violently if necessary for economic advance. The oral healers, as well as the literate natural magicians and occult philosophers operated within the organic order of nature, anima mundi, a new image of nature as a female to be controlled and dissected through experiments arose. He's the first one to argue these ideas. He's not the last. The cosmos slash nature became machina mundi, world machine. Machines became structural models for Western ontology and epistemology. Magic and animism became persecuted and viewed as heretical. They were replaced by a rational management of nature. The legacy of this history in Peru today in the small town of Lamas, where our center is located, today a shaman is commonly called a brujo, if it's a male, or bruja, if it's a female. And that word in Spanish means sorcerer or witch. And all indigenous spirits are called diablo or demonio, which means devil or demon. My godson, Randy Chung Gonzalez was initiated by discarnate spirits six years ago against his will and initiated to be a shaman for three and a half years. He's now in charge of our center and together we've written a book on his initiation 
along with my reflections on the er eradication of shamanism in the West. The book is being published first in Sp Spanish by Kairos Press in Spain and should be out end of the wind, by the end of the winter. It's also being published by Green Fire Press in English and will come out a little later. Uh, it is illustrated by Randy, who is a painter. This is one of his visions. Yeah. Here's Randy. I can see this. Oops, sorry. What happened? Previous. Um, he calls himself now a curandero, meaning a healer. He was raised by secular parents and had no previous interest in Amazonian shamanism. He didn't welcome his initiation. In fact, I forced him to go to an ayahuasca session to accompany me, uh, but it was impossible to refuse it. He tried to abandon this path about halfway down, but various deities that appeared to him prevented him. He has now, I can't see what this says. Ah, oh God, this is so annoying. Uh, He has now accepted his calling and offers ayahuasca retreats in our center. He received powers, healing powers from many indigenous spirits, as well as the Virgin of Guadalupe, who he didn't know who she was when she first appeared to him, Ganesha from India, Shiva from India, Olokun, a a Yoruba, Orisha, and many others. So the mechanization of life and of the earth. Here I chose these two slides, these two uh, images. Uh, here is an old uh, mechanical duck. But as we will see, uh, the human body was seen as a machine. And here it is an animal's body. And this slide to me really captures the mechanization of agriculture in industrial agriculture in the global north and much of the global south as well, unfortunately. So, Here's a slide of deforestation in Amazonia. And I want to discuss a Peruvian example. In the previous government of Alan Garcia, he had promulgated hundreds of legislative decrees to implement a free trade agreement with the United States and open wide the doors of his country constituting some 75% of the Peruvian territory, most of it in Amazonia, to multinational companies, transnational capital and neoliberalization. Nakedly, I was here at that time, this was 2009, so I heard all of this on the media. Nakedly racist language was used by Alan Garcia and members of his government who parroted Garcia's characterization of the social and indigenous movements that had been protesting these policies since the signing of the free trade agreement as extortionists. These extortionists claim behaved like the dog of the gardener who is not hungry but others from eating by owning millions of hectares, oh sorry, millions of hectares of unproductive land, which could only be made profitable by privatizing them through selling or giving them in concession to transnational companies. Indigenous people were in this way characterized as being primitive and ignorant savages standing in the way of progress for all Peruvians. I was utterly shocked listening to the, to the radio, 
reading the press, it was just incredible. Um, Alan Garcia was finally uh, accused and proven uh, of fraud and uh, extortion and embezzlement. And when the police arrived to arrest him, he shot himself, he died. So the point being that this kind of mindset of me mechanized, uh, de desacralized uh, world cosmos nature is often in, in the time of the, especially 16th, 17th century, but even earlier, thought of as a great clock uh, that God has wound up and now works on his own. This is a very famous one in the Cathedral of Strasbourg, which where I was born, uh, is very famous. It's an astronomical clock where everything moves and turns. Uh, the, the, this current version uh, dates from the 19th century, but the previous version, version, version was from the 16th century. Oh, I can't see my, uh, what can I do? I know, this is what I can do. Um, in 17, so NATO becomes an insentient mechanism. And of course, uh, Descartes, René Descartes, the French philosopher is key in this. During the 17th century, the fathers of Western modernity and science such as René Descartes, Robert Boyle, and Isaac Newton actively uh, argued against the worldview of Anima Mundi, which by the way, was murdered by the Inquisition and the people holding that. The following quote from Descartes, who established the philosophical basis for the new science, argues against the cosmo cosmocentric worldview of Anima Mundi, and I quote, there exist no occult forces in stones or plants. There are no amazing and marvelous sympathies and antipathies. In fact, there exists nothing in the whole of nature which cannot be explained in terms of purely corporeal causes totally devoid of mind and thought. By the way, the term corporeal being used at the, at the time would today be replaced by material or atomic, something like that. The campaign against Anima Mundi was not a mere sideshow, a minor issue for the fathers of Western modernity. It was at the heart of the emergent worldview they were championing, believing, oops, how do I minimize this? Living and cosmos had to be effectively annulled. The material cosmos to take its place. Such an eradication has meant historically the murder of those holding such a cosmocentric vision during the burning times. Birth of a totally anthropocentric means with man, and I uh, used deliberately man rather than human, and you see why. And for me, uh, the Im image, the ancient image of the really, for me, I may not work for you, uh, this notion of man at the center and anthropocentrism. 